electrolytes. We set our strong electrolytes completely dissociate when they hit water into their ions. This is still chapter four, right? This is still chapter four. All of this is still chapter four. Chapter five will start Wednesday after your quiz. Um, so what were examples of strong electrolytes? We could pick up ionic compounds. We need to be a little bit careful with specifying ionic compounds. What's the issue with ionic compounds? Not all of them are soluble. So our ionic compounds is a good trigger, but what we then need to do is verify against what? Our solubility rules. Okay, so that's a good trick. What other compounds are strong electrolytes? Isn't it like alkali metals? Right idea referencing the alkali metals. We're looking at that strong word being very prominent within this. Strong bases. There's your alkali metal reference. And your solubility for that matter. Strong bases and strong acids. How do you know it was a strong base or a strong acid? You, know them. you memorized it. You are required to have those memorized or you write them on your cheat sheet. We also encounter weak electrolytes. These only dissociate partially when dissolved in water. What are going to be our weak electrolytes? Our weak bases. These tend to be our weak acids and bases. So it becomes a little bit trickier to determine these, but that's really all you've got. So your weak acids and your weak bases. Hi. Um, our ionic compounds are either soluble or insoluble, so it's a little bit harder to classify those according to the weak electrolyte rule. What we'd instead look at um, would be our weak acids and weak bases. The last one. Are non-electrolytes. So these would be compounds that are not your acids or bases at least as you guys are aware of them, okay. and are also covalent, okay, or molecular compounds. Examples of that, sugar was a good example of a non-electrolyte. Okay. So those are easy or relatively easy ways to go through and classify and identify these. How can we tell experimentally which one we're looking at. We can hook up a couple wires through light and, or to a, a, this picture, okay? And we can put our electrolyte gas into solution and see what happens. If the light lights up, we're getting an electric current moving through. Well, for the electric current to move through, we have to have ions that can kind of catch and help shuttle the electrons through that solution. Does that necessarily mean, if we get, say, a weak light, that we don't have a strong electrolyte? No. Why not? Just have a little bit of electrolyte. Okay. Remember, our ions, when we dissociate these things into our water, need to shuttle the electrons back and forth. What if there's only one ion in the solution? Okay. That's not going to do a very efficient job of shuttling the electric current between our two electrodes. So we need a proper concentration of each of those. So we can vary that concentration, and that's going to determine what happens within our solution. Typically, when we take a strong electrolyte, we end up adding enough uh, strong or enough of any species just with a spoon, a spoonful or a spatula that it dissociates completely, and we get that electric current. Okay? But we could take a weak electrolyte, and we could up the concentration of the weak electrolyte to the point that there's now enough free ions floating through that we do see full electric current. Okay. The next part of this is, let's say we're looking at a strong electrolyte. Are all strong electrolytes going to provide us with the same amount of ions? Yeah. Really? If I take sodium chloride and say HCl, I don't get the same amount of ions? You do. Oh, I do. Well, you just said it was well, no. more than one, right? I mean, you have if we change our compound to say something else, uh, let's go with magnesium chloride. Well, magnesium is a plus two charge. Chloride has a minus one. If we look to the salt for magnesium chloride, it's MgCl2. 
When I hit that into water, what happens? You get three ions. I get three ions as opposed to sodium chloride, I would get two, two ions. The ions are what are causing the electric current to shift through or shuttle through that sample. So depending on what salt we add, we may end up seeing a variety of different results depending on how many ions are actually present. Okay? Kind of make sense? Cool. Recognizing chemical reactions. So we've talked about three primary chemical reactions. That M1, which I typically refer to as double replacement because it's an easier word to say or sequence of words. We've got the neutralization reaction, which is a double replacement. It just happens to be a very specific one. And we've also looked officially at redox, but we're really referencing single replacement in the course of this class. You will be having a very hard time finding both this slide and the last slide, because I made them, for those of you <laughs> frantically looking for it. Okay. So <clears throat> within these, what I tried to do was come up with patterns that you can recognize and find within it. So in that first one, our double replacement, what are we looking for? Well, we find our cation, which I happen to color as blue. blue. Our cation is consistent all the way through. What ends up changing in the course of the reaction is I trade that with the anion. Okay. You'll notice there are no amounts specified for each of these. Because if I start specifying amounts, it now gets too specific. Every reaction that you run within a double replacement. You find the cation, you find the anions, you do your swap and everything's happy. Okay. Then you have to balance the formulas. Make sure your formulas are correct, then you can balance the whole equation. How do we know a double replacement reaction occurred? <coughs> What's that? Is it you always get water? So if we look at the double replacement, it's an interesting question. Double replacement, do you see water written up there? So we move to neutralization, one of our common triggers is that we see water happening. And you're right, in a neutralization we typically see water show up. Okay. Well in both those cases we're going to run into an issue of how do we know a reaction occurred. Our solution started as, I didn't specify them in here, they're almost always aqueous. Okay. Why do we start everything as aqueous? Because water happens to be the easiest and cheapest solvent readily available for us. Okay. So if we look, took a look at your suggestion, which is a good one, for our neutralization, yes, we form water and a salt. Did we start with water? What does AQ mean? Dissolved in water. Dissolved in water. Did we start with water? Yes. Yeah, we did. All we did was form a little bit more water. Can we see that formation? Nope. That becomes problematic. So good call. Yes, water was formed. But how do you know in the lab? You don't walk in the lab and say, whoa, look at the water grow. It didn't do that. Okay. What can we visualize to decide whether either of these reactions actually worked? So if we look at our double replacement reaction, we can look for the formation of a precipitate we'd have a solid and, say, an aqueous compound. How do we know it's solid? Solubility. Our solubility rules. Okay. In lab, how do we know it's a solid? You see it form. You see this cloudy substance appear. So that works great for our double replacements because we do a lot of solubility stuff up there. What, what about the neutralization? Typically, when we go through and form this, we do form water, and our phase on that is a liquid. But our salt formation is almost always aqueous. So if we get lucky, it's a solid, but typically it's not. How do we know that particular reaction actually occurred? Activity series is a nice suggestion, except that's the single replacement reaction. So that kind of fizzled out. <clears throat> Solubility rules could be helpful if we were forming a solid. No solids. Does it get warmer? We have to look for something else. By changing the chemical arrangement of those atoms, we are changing the energy within the system. Okay. Well, I can't create or destroy energy, so if I change the energy in the bonds connecting my reactants and products, 
either an excess of energy has to be released somehow, or I have to absorb that energy <coughs> somehow. Either way, if I absorbed energy, what would happen to the container? It gets colder. I could see a temperature difference or feel a temperature difference. In the case of acid-base reactions, what actually happens? They are exothermic. Remember that ACS video, acid to water? Okay. It's an exothermic reaction that can cause substances to boil, and that can become a big danger because it is a very exothermic reaction. So in our neutralizations, we can't find solubility. We have to look to temperature, and what we will see within our temperature is that it will always increase because our acid-base reactions are always exothermic. Okay. Somebody else mentioned another observable that we could do, which I think we talked about in this class. I don't think I did it in any other class. We could look for a gas formation. We formed that carbonic acid that then rapidly dissociates into CO2 and water. So we could also look for a gas formation. In a single replacement reaction, see how much that homework actually covered this. How do we know a single replacement reaction occurred? Actually, somebody said it. An activity series. That's what we're going to end up talking about today, though it's not on the quiz. We won't stress on that. Okay? Next part is looking at oxidation numbers. Uh, how confident are you guys within your oxidation numbers? Not much. Okay, well, let's pick a couple examples here. Always, every single time, never fails. This method, guaranteed. Okay. A couple things you need to remember. The number of the atom times the oxidation. Number of that atom plus the number of the next atom times the oxidation number of that atom. So on and so forth until this then totals or we run out of atoms. Good thing I ran out of space. Our overall charge. The one extra rule that you have to have memorized, the oxidation number for oxygen is negative 2. So how do we crank that one out? What's the first atom? Carbon. Carbon. How many of them are there? One. One. The three only applies to what's directly in front of it, which is in then that oxygen. If I wanted it to apply to the carbon, what would I need to add? Parentheses. parentheses. So now the three applies to whatever's in the parentheses. I don't have that, so the three only goes to the uh, oxygen. Times what? The oxidation number for carbon. We always have to solve for it, so it's x. Plus, what's the next atom? Oxygen. How many oxygens are there? Three. Oxidation number? I'm going to be a bit obnoxious on this one. No, it's not negative two yet. I don't know what it is. So it's y. Some unknown variable. What's the next atom? There isn't another atom. So I can now say this equals our overall charge. What's our overall charge? How do you know our overall charge is negative two? Our overall charge is always given to you in the upper right-hand corner, okay? particularly when determining oxidation numbers. The one case where it might not be, so I said determine the oxidation state on nitrogen in nitrate. To answer that, what do you have to do? You have to know what nitrate is. Okay? There's a nomenclature question in there as well. Okay? If you're given a formula, the charge is given to you every single time. We now have a problem because in our equation we have two unknowns, one equation. We can't solve until we remember the other rule that I told you to remember. The oxidation state for oxygen is negative 2. So I know y equals negative 2. I can do my substitution. I'll get x plus 3 times negative 2 equals negative 2. x minus 6 equals negative 2. And I get x equal to plus 4. Okay. Those of you doing it in your head without any work, good job. Those of you that can't, don't worry about it. Write it out. Okay. 
Those of you that are writing it out, you'll probably get the answer right when it comes to a quiz. Those of you doing it in your head, that'll be the time it fails. Okay? You guys want to give one on, take a shot at one on your own? Okay. So if you got questions, raise your hand. I'll come start it again. A lot of good questions came out of that, and in those good questions, you ended up pointing out that I lied. You can't just memorize negative 2 for oxygen and that formula. There's a few extra ones you have to know. Um, I would flip back to those slides, but I have no idea how far back in that we did the oxidation rule on what things you had to have memorized. Ooh, please don't lose connection. All right. So let's go through and take a look at the upper right-hand corner for the moment. All the work's actually already written out there, so I'm just going to kind of talk through it. So what I'm talking about is that FeCl3. Okay. This is an interesting one for a couple reasons. Number one, a lot of questions about the charge. Well, I said the charge is always specified. Now you're freaking out because there's no charge specified. Okay. There is a charge specified. It's zero. That's the only time we, can't, we don't have to write something. If it's one, I now have to specify plus one. Okay. So there is a charge specified on that compound. It is zero. Okay. But if we go through and solve this the way that I'd been suggesting, you would run into the issue of 1 times x plus 3 times y equals zero. You now have a very hard problem here because, again, you have two unknowns and no way to potentially solve this. Okay. Well, there's two answers to that. One, remember that thing that I forgot to tell you? Well, I did tell you. I just told you didn't have to memorize it. Okay. Our halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, will always be a negative 1 unless they're bound to oxygen. Well, I don't see any oxygen, so the chlorine is negative one. a negative 1. So I know y equals negative 1. I could now potentially go through and solve. Actually, I'm going to multiply all that through. And I get x equal to plus 3. I now know the oxidation number for both the chloride and the iron. There's a second way to solve this that doesn't go through knowing the charge on chloride. You're going to have to know it eventually for our lower left corner, our SF6, uh, but we'll talk about a different way to solve this in just a second. Go ahead. If I had written down my notes from last week, was chlorine is negative 1, other halides are positive 1. Then that was a typo on the slide. It should have said minus 1 all the way through. Our halides are always minus 1. Hydrogen is typically a plus 1. It can be a minus 1. Yeah, I got that. But your halides are always a negative 1. And less bound to oxygen. And less bound to oxygen. And then they are determined according to the oxidation state of the compound. Okay. So this compound gives us a quick dodge on that whole process. Because this compound is named according to what rules? Ionic, which means I can split that into the ions. The charge on the iron is? Plus three. Plus three. The charge in the chloride is? Minus, minus one. So I can simplify this into a new question. What is the oxidation state of Fe plus three? three? I go through and solve for it. There's one iron times X. I don't know its oxidation number. And its charge now is plus three. So that's what we've got in blue which means the oxidation number on the iron has to be plus 3. If we go through and look at the chloride, okay, it's Cl minus. The charge on chloride is a minus 1. I can go through and now solve for that. How many chlorides in chloride? 1. 1 times its oxidation number, I don't know, equals my overall charge on that compound, <coughs> minus 1. The oxidation number for chloride becomes minus one. Okay, so with our ionic compounds, we can kind of skip around memorizing a bunch of extra rules because within the ionic compounds, we're required to know the charges. Once we know the charges, we can start to simplify and now predict our oxidation numbers based off of those charges. Okay, what's shown in red underneath there? went through and said once we figured out the oxidation number of iron, we actually went all the way back to our original formula to try and figure out the oxidation state uh, for chloride. And if we go through and solve it that way, what do we end up with? 
our overall charge will be zero, but our oxidation number for chloride will still be negative one. It still adds up properly. Okay. I'm probably going to regret <laughs> clearing everything, but I'm going to clear everything. Last one we'll talk about before we do the quiz, SF6. Okay. What kind of compound is this? Not ionic. Not ionic. Good answer. More accurately, covalent. Okay, that's a little bit more challenging to deal with. We don't have this cheat method of splitting it apart into the ions. Okay. So how do we approach this? Well, same way we've approached every other question. How many sulfurs are there? Wow. Oxidation number. Don't know X. Plus how many fluorides? Six. Technically fluorines. How, what's its oxidation number? Negative Y. This equals, how do we know it's zero? Nothing is written in the upper right-hand corner. We do now have a problem here. Right? We have no way of determining those oxidation numbers outside of rote memorization. And that rote memorization is that our halides, unless they are bound to oxygen, will have a negative one oxidation number which means y equals negative 1. I get x plus 6 times negative 1 equals 0. And I get x equals positive 6. I now have the oxidation number for sulfur. OK. Questions? Oh, yes. So what is our answer supposed to look like? <coughs> so. What your answer is going to be is depending on the question. If I ask the oxidation number for fluoride, is 6 going to make sense? No. Okay, so it's really going to depend on the question asked. Okay. The next part of this, and I'm pretty sure the next slide is the quiz. Oh, no, it's not. So cool. The next part of this is looking at an individual reaction and deciding what happened within it. You've seen double replacements. You've seen neutralizations. Now we have this redox slash single replacement reaction, which gets in the way. So if we look at this equation, calcium solid plus oxygen gas to form calcium oxide, we can go through and balance the crap out of that. Oh, awesome. Good job. <laughs> what type of reaction is it? Redox. Well, it's not double replacement. It's not a neutralization. It's not even really a single replacement. Okay? It's technically a combination reaction that is also classified as a redox. How do you know it's a redox equation? What you would have to do is look at the oxidation numbers. If you are remotely suspicious that you're being asked to look at a redox question, pick any element you want and compare its <coughs> oxidation number on both sides. If it's changed, you have a redox. If it hasn't changed, maybe you guessed poorly, check another element. <laughs> okay. If it still hasn't changed, check the next element. If it still hasn't changed, check the next element. Okay. Until you've covered all of your elements. And if it hasn't changed, then it's not, it's not a redox question. Is there a faster way of going through and looking at these so that you can very quickly say, absolutely, by looking at this, it has to be a redox? What is the oxidation state of any species or any element in its elemental state? Yeah. Zero. What is the elemental state of oxygen? Zero. Minus two. O2. Sorry, I asked poorly. The symbol for elemental oxygen. O2. O2, O2. Gas. I have oxygen in its elemental state as a reactant. Okay. If it does not change, its oxidation state will stay the same. If it changes into any compound, what happened to its oxidation state? Changed. It changed. Then by definition, it is redox. So I'm just asked, is this a redox equation? I will look for anything that's elemental state. Oxygen gas, elemental state, look at the product, not elemental state anymore. That's a redox question. Are there other elements that you can key in on? Does it have to be oxygen? Okay. How about the elemental state for calcium? Huh. Zero. The elemental state for calcium is a solid with zero charge. If we look at our formula, 
What do we have for our calcium? On the reactant side, what is the charge of calcium on our reactant side? There's nothing written in the upper right-hand corner. It is zero. Guess what calcium state is at the beginning of this reaction? It is in its elemental state. It's zero. Look to the product. Is it with anything else? Yes. By definition, its oxidation state changed. Redox. Right. So if you can find some element that changed its oxidation state, that reaction is by definition redox. Okay. You don't even have to go anything beyond that. You just say it's redox. If that's all you're asking me, I'm done and I move on. Can we make it a more difficult question? Yeah. We can say, well, which it, what happened to calcium? Okay. We'd look at the oxidation state then for calcium. Do I care about any other element? No, the question only asked about calcium, so keep your focus on calcium. What changed to the calcium? It went from a zero oxidation state to a plus two. How do we become positive as an element? You have to lose electrons. Loss of electrons is? Oxidation. Oxidation. Because you remembered, if you want to use the full phrase, Leo the lion goes grr. Loss, electrons, oxidation. There's our Leo. Okay? What if the question was, which species was reduced? This now becomes a trickier question. Because now you can't zero in on just a single element. You have to zero in on all elements and determine what was reduced. Okay? We'll change that phrase. It's not what was reduced. It was what gained electrons. Okay. For something to gain electrons, what has to happen to its oxidation number? It has to decrease. It has to decrease. So I would now go back up to my problem, pick an element, and look at its oxidation change across the reaction. Calcium went from a 0 to a plus 2. Did that decrease? Yeah. No. Which means? It's not reduced. It wasn't reduced. How many species are reactants? Two. Two. Well, if calcium isn't the answer, oxygen is by process of elimination. Okay? You don't got a lot of time on the test, that's what you do. Process of elimination, move forward. Let's look at the long path. We look at oxygen. Oxidation state for oxygen on the reactant side is zero because it is in its elemental state. What is the oxidation state of oxygen in the product? Negative two. To go from a zero to a negative two, what did I do? decreased the number, that matches a gain of electrons, that matches my reduction. Oxygen was the species that was reduced. Questions? My curveball, what was the reducing agent? Oxygen. No, calcium. That's the thing. Remember our issue with our agents? A reducing agent caused something else to be reduced, which means the reducing agent was oxidized. Which species was oxidized? Calcium. Okay. So you have to be careful. As soon as you hear that ing show up anywhere, or you see agent, or you see ant, oxidant, reductant, hear that ant, you should be very, very careful with what's happening within that process. Questions on any of that? Okay. We can look at more examples, oxidizing and reducing. All you're doing is classifying your oxidation states, separating them out, and looking at what changes. What happened to the oxidation state? Once you know what happen to it as far as the electrons go, you can then start to predict oxidized and reduced. Our single replacement and our double replacements, okay, redox reactions, ions and aqueous solutions can oxidize an element. Okay. So what we're talking about, say an ion, I'm going to probably pick the wrong one, but oh well. We're saying an ion, copper plus 2, can oxidize an element. 
Oxidation is? Oxidation is? Loss of electrons. So this ion is causing zinc to be oxidized. What would have to happen to the zinc if it was oxidized? If it was oxidized, it has to lose electrons. Loss of electrons is oxidation. For it to lose electrons, what would I need to change about zinc on the product side? It's oxidation number. But our oxidation number is never specified. What is specified? The charge. The charge. What would I see happen to the charge? It becomes positive. Okay. What would happen to the zinc? You're, fair enough. Copper. I was wondering why everybody was mouthing copper at me. What are you talking about? Okay. Well, if the zinc lost electrons, what did the copper have to do? Gain electrons, which means its oxidation number needs to decrease or go towards that negative side. How far we go in those directions um, depends on how many electrons were actually transferred. In this case, we end up taking that to zinc plus two or copper and its elemental state at a zero. Why were our metals typically not go negative? They're always positive. That's a nice dodge to that question. <laughs> electronegativities, their electronegativities are very low, meaning they give up their electrons. Okay. So now we got the quiz. So pull out a sheet of paper, no notes. Moles of our solute. I have no idea when that stopped. For liters of our solution. It's still 32 minutes, so I got a decent amount in there. Okay. Fail my exam. What? Said if I fail my exam now. Uh, well, there's not a lot I can do about that. <laughs> Molarity just happens to be one way to go through and measure it. You'll also encounter something known as molality. Uh, any ideas why they came up with molality versus molarity? <laughs> Ultimately, you'd be surprised how many times this happens. Someone saw that molarity was being used really commonly. They're like, well, molality is a really, or my measurement of concentration is a really important measurement, so I'm going to make it sound similar to that other one so that people think it's equally important. Dead serious. It happens all the time. Okay? That's probably where you're getting this molarity molality issue popping up. I personally don't like molality, but it shows up. So, moles per volume. So when we go through to mix a solution, we can take our solid, we can weigh that out, which gives us a mass, not moles, and then we can add it to a special flask, which allows us to measure the volume very, very accurately. And we can then add enough of our solvent, in this case water, to go through and make the solution. All right. So if we were given the number of grams of a solute, we'll also need to know its chemical formula and the volume of the solution, and we want to calculate the molarity of the solution. Okay. All of these problems are conversions, dimensional analysis. Regardless of what anybody tells you, oh, use this formula, it's a load of crap, it's dimensional analysis, all the way through. Okay. So dimensional analysis, you, what you start with is what do you want? What do we want as our answer for this one? Moles of solute. Well, I, mean, I want the moles of my solute over the liters of my solution. What do I start with? Grams. We got grams of solute, so you guys decided to pick that, so let's start with that. What do we say, 23.4? Grams of our solute. Is grams of solute moles of solute? No. no, so I need to do a conversion. Grams of solute, moles of solute. I wish I knew some kind of conversion that related the mass and the and moles of a particular compound. I can use the molar mass of the compound. So we would then have to look up using our periodic table and determine the molar mass of sodium, multiply it by two. The molar mass of sulfur, 
Multiply it by 1. Molar mass of oxygen. Multiply it by 4. And we get some magic number that we can put in front of the grams. And we'll have one mole up there. I now have moles of solute in my numerator. This is phenomenal. I'm getting closer to my answer. But what do I want in the denominator? Liters. Liters. I don't have liters in the denominator yet. I need to get volume into the denominator. Do I know something about the volume? I know I have 125 milliliters. I can put that on the bottom. What would I put on top? If I put in grams, is it still the same as 125 milliliters? No, it would be 125 milliliters per gram. Doesn't work. What do I put in on top that does not change the 125 and does not change the unit of mole milliliters? One. I now have moles per milliliter. What do I want? Moles per liter. I wish I had something that would allow me to convert between milliliters and liters. 1,000 liters. 1,000 milliliters is one liter. I now have my answer. Okay. All done in one swift fluid line without any other pauses or hesitations. Does this require practice? Absolutely. But if you follow dimensional analysis through, it will work. And when will it work? Every single time. Feel free to take any shortcuts you want. Just realize sometimes that won't work. And I apologize. 